around the world. So just to check with you that my screen has changed, yes? Yeah, okay. Um, so you've introduced me already, so I'm not gonna waste too much time, but I'm a hydrogeologist um, and I do mainly water chemistry. I also do a lot of work with gas chemistry. Um, integrated Masters from the University of Plymouth and MSc in Hydrogeology from the University of Strathclyde and just finalising my PhD at the University of Glasgow uh, in Scotland. And I've worked all over the world but mostly um, on projects in Sub-Saharan Africa so I've done a huge amount of work in Kenya but I've also done some work in Ethiopia and Malawi as well. Um, and um, most of my work involves looking at the groundwater impacts from geothermal resource development and this can include things like contamination risk so for example heavy metals such as arsenic are quite common in many geothermal waters around the world and um, but if there is a system leak what are the risks of that arsenic and other heavy metals making it into the drinking water supply what are the risks of over abstraction of water uh, the risk of drawdown might impact groundwater access and availability and we also have to look at the risk to ecosystems if we're using water supplies and a couple of the pictures here that i've included so the left right um, bottom images are from kenya um, and then the top image is in ethiopia um, lots of sampling of geysers and pools and soil gas sampling and all sorts of stuff has gone into my research so who should we be collaborating with? So I actually want to put this out to you guys, um, first of all. I've got a few messages saying that people can't see my slides properly. I have shared my screen. Um, sorry, guys. Let me stop sharing and then let me share again. Let's try. So can everybody see a full screen? Francisco, can you see a full screen? Uh, no. Um. Yeah, there is something, something missing there. So now, it was working a minute. Now, now it is there. Have you still got it? Now it is good. Right, okay. Not sure what happened there. Sorry, guys. Um, so, yeah, so who should we be working with? Who should we be collaborating with? And I really wanted to put this out to you guys first of all, but I can't see the chat box. So do you guys want to turn your microphones on uh, quickly for a minute and we can just have a, a quick discussion? Everybody wants to do that. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on who we should be collaborating with when we're developing resources, um, sort of what subjects and things like that. So do people want to shout out a couple of different suggestions? Would anybody like to have an input? <laughs> Everyone's gone shy. <laughs> That's okay. Victor, All right. So who, who collaborates with you? Well, I wanted to know who, who you think you should be collaborating with. <laughs> 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 All right, we'll move that. We'll move, move on from that. So uh, I think if, if you have if you want some input, sorry, you know. Uh, I think it's a good <laughs> point. And uh, no, I think that whatever we do, we need to somehow we, we have a, a certain uh, area of domain and then we need the uh, alliances collaborators uh, to somehow join resources and combine resources no to to, to have a meaningful a minimum meaningful purpose no uh, in that respect i mean we, we, we are you're talking about specific subject but still i think it, it, you're dealing with social aspects not only technical legal aspects for sure i mean you're talking about the quality of underground water and drinking water so it's certainly legal <laughs> It has to be there, and then and technical, chemical. I mean, you, you already have a series of uh, backgrounds there that should be involved. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's actually probably a lot more complex than at least students might realize. Um, people working in, in the industry who, or even who are in academia who've been doing it for a long time might be a little bit more familiar. But from a student standpoint, um, it's probably a lot more complex. So for resource development, um, you know, the first things that jump to mind are the geologists and the engineers. And this is every discipline almost of geology. So your geophysics and your chemistry, both fluid and rock um, chemistry, uh, petrophysicists, geophysicists, um, people who work on heat flow, um, hydrogeologists like myself. Engineers, we need the, the civil, the mechanical, and the electrical engineers involved in geothermal resource development. Civil engineers predominantly for, for our infrastructure development, um, and our electrical and mechanical are heavily involved with the drilling programs. But people start sort of, certainly at a, an early career, um, very early student level, um, don't realize all of the other subjects that we need to be bringing on board when we are developing um, and exploring potential for resources around the world. And so we have environmental scientists and conservationists. So we need to understand the environment that we are working in. Uh, this is a, a much bigger picture. It's very sort of a complex topic and there's so much input that's required. Conservationists, quite often that surprises people. If we're gonna do this properly, um, we need to be bringing these guys on board because we're going to be working in environments where we might have endangered species um, or species that are sensitive to certain noise or dust pollution and things like that. And so we need to understand what the flora and the fauna is and make sure that we are not damaging their environment or we are mitigating or moving them. That's something that we do in the UK is if we have protected species on land, we sometimes um, move them to a different location so that the species isn't uh, isn't affected by the work. And we also need to think about social scientists. So this is something else that a lot of people sort of overlook when they're thinking about geothermal resource development. Um, we need to understand the communities and their needs and the impact uh, risks that might, there might be. Um, educators. So educators are actually really, really key in uh, in geothermal. They can help us not just spread the word about geothermal as a fantastic resource for power, but they can help us communicate it in an appropriate way for our audience. They can help us improve transparency and they can teach us how to communicate with our audiences in an appropriate way. And of course, bringing it all together is our policy legislation developers. We need those guys on board to make sure that everything that we do is done correctly and incorporates everything safely that we've just gone through there are all these different roles that are involved in uh, geothermal resource development so i'm a huge advocate for geothermal resource development but not at the expense of other aspects of our environment and today we're talking about geothermal but actually this kind of thing applies to all sorts of different resource development and we have this this word stewardship but what does it mean uh, and what should it be applied to? So stewardship is the job of supervising or taking care of something. And it's the taking care of something that we need to be thinking about when we're developing a resource. We need to be taking care of the environment that we are working in. And the idea is an ethic. It's an ethic that embodies the responsible planning and management of resources. We have a couple of different kinds of stewardships. So we have earth stewardship. Um, so sustaining and enhancing Earth's life support systems. Um, so this is sort of an earth stewardship involves shaping trajectories for social and ecological change at local and global scales to enhance ecosystem resilience and human well-being. So ecosystem resilience to what we're doing and ensuring that human well-being is a top priority. And this should make a bit more sense as I go through the talk. Environmental stewardships. Um, so responsible use of protection of the natural environment through conservation and sustainable practices. So our part here is going to be the sustainable practices. What we're doing when we're developing a resource has to be sustainable and the practices need to be best practices globally. 
Aldo Leopold championed environmental stewardship based on the land ethic, dealing with man's relation to land and the animals and plants which grow upon it. And he described three types of environmental stewards. We have the doers, so the doers act. They are the kind of people who, if there is an oil spill, for example, they're the ones helping with the clear up. We have the donors, they donate funds. It might be their own funds or they might organize public fundraising events. And sometimes they're government organizations and quite often they're non-government organizations. And finally, we have practitioners. These guys work on a day-to-day -day basis to steer governmental agencies, scientists and stakeholder groups, along with other groups, toward a stewardship outcome. And this is where we come in, uh, into the, into the um, stewardship for environment. We are the practitioners. We have resource stewardship. So an approach to resource management which views humans as caretakers of the natural world. So with the ever increasing population growth, there is the need to sustainably manage our resources so that future generations can benefit from them also. And this hasn't been easy in the past with the increasing rate at which humans are consuming non-renewable non resources, coupled with the rate at which population is growing. Nevertheless, technology advances in food production have led others to believe that irrespective of increasing numbers of population, there will be enough food and other resources to meet the demands. And one of the concepts, of quite a new concept that incorporates this is this idea of the circular economy and it's a major approach in sustainable resource management. I'm not gonna go into circular economy because it's incredibly complex, but I put this up here. So this is the butterfly diagram from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And as I said, I'm not gonna go into it because there's loads here, but you can go onto the foundation website and have a good old look for yourself. But one thing that this includes is cascading the use of or part of a product for different applications. So our product is heat, and this very uh, is very applicable in geothermal where we have the opportunity to use every degree of heat from geothermal waters for different applications, allowing us to get so much more out of a resource and waste much less. So some of you may have heard of cascade systems, they're usually all direct use applications. And this is an example from uh, where I work in Kenya. Um, and the picture to the top right, so the wellhead here, this is the system I'm, I'm working on is a high enthalpy system. It's super hot, borderline super critical. So temperatures in excess of 340 degrees Celsius in the reservoir. But this particular well, for whatever reason, missed the target. And so at the wellhead, it's only 90 degrees Celsius and I think it's 1.6 bar, which isn't high enough to produce electricity, which is the aim of this particular site. However, instead of wasting what they'd invested in drilling this well, they've decided to use the heat anyway. And so they have top right picture, there is a dairy. Um, the temperature is about 87 degrees. Um, and because it's on nomadic lands, Maasai lands, we have a lot of people moving through with, car, uh, with cows and now they have a facility to pasteurize their milk before taking it to market. From there, system cas cascades down, so it's that word, cascade, down at 60 degrees to a laundry facility, which is the bottom right there. And you have both washing and drying facilities. The water then cascades down to 47 degrees and water, cooler water, is incorporated into the system uh, to bring the temperature down for the water down to 29 degrees. And this is optimum temperature for certain fish species. And you've got sort of a picture there on the uh, bottom left of the fish ponds. Um, and they grow fish from juvenile in these ponds. Once they've grown to adulthood, they can be used as food. And whilst they're growing, they harvest the fish feces because the fish feces is rich in ammonia. And then from here, the temperatures cascade down again to 20 degrees. The ammonia from the fish species is diluted and it's used to feed tomato plants that you can see there in that top left picture. And the 20 degree temperature is used to maintain the heat within the greenhouses. Now, this particular site is on the equator, so it's nice and hot during the day. But the temperature contrast at night, it drops to about 10 degrees at night. And this encourages uh, condensation within the greenhouses. However, if you're maintaining the heat 
within the greenhouses, you don't get condensation. And because you don't get condensation, you don't get fungal infections and huge um, uh, insect infestations as well, which increases the productivity of the crop. And this particular crop here was worth $32,500 to the local community once it was harvested, which is really impressive, I think. Um, and also, there have been suggestions made quite recently that the rising heat from discharge ponds could also be used to turn turbines and create power as well. But that is still very much experimental. We also have social stewardship. Um, so working with and involving communities in resource development. Um, I heard uh, on the introduction mention the Geothermal Villages Network, which I set up. And uh, so this has been set up in Kenya at the moment, but actually has a global applicability, so it can be applied anywhere. And the idea is that um, we have social scientists working with the community, directly with the communities, um, who have got a geothermal resource uh, close by. And so this might be sort of small geysers and hot springs and things that they might use to, uh, for household chores or for bathing and work directly with these guys. Um, we do community mappings that understand the layout of their community, the numbers within the communities, understand the community needs, so a community needs assessment, and this would actually incorporate talking to the community and finding out what it is they would like to get out of their geothermal resource, so whether that is heating for a greenhouse or um, electricity to power a phone and some lighting if they don't have electricity. Um, and also the social scientists would help us assess any heritage or cultural significance of this geothermal site as well. And of course the geologists would be involved in identifying and assessing a resource potential, help us identify the applications that we could use, so they'll be working with the social scientists and the communities also. Obviously well siting and assessing any hazards that might be associated with it. Engineers, of course, would develop our technology and they would develop the sort of uh, the wells uh, that fits with the community needs. And then the policy education and communication would make sure that the uh, communities understand what we're doing and they're communicated with at every step. And it's all about this idea of being transparent and making sure that they're involved every step of the way. Sort of geothermal related uh, corporate social responsibility includes the Forest Stewardship Council. These guys are responsible for uh, ensuring responsible production of wood products. So this is from the management of tree felling all the way down to the final products like paper. We have the World Coca Foundation uh, who ensure um, fair working conditions and earnings from the production and sale of coca products. Alliance for Water Stewardship ensuring quality access availability and um, putting in legislation for extraction licenses and things like that. And then probably one that many of us are familiar with is um, Total Clarity. And this is the management of diamond, diamond uh, mining um, and the, the putting an end to the horrendous things that happened in the Central African Republic and the Democratic Republic of Congo over the mining. And there's another similar initiative uh, called the Kimberlite Initiative, I think it's called, which is a very similar concept as well. Collectively, all these stewardship concepts incorporate ethical, legal, economic, and philanthropic responsibilities, and we must make sure that these are applied to geothermal resource development as a formal and demonstrable requirement in the future. Now, what I want to try and do now is, as a hydrogeologist, try and demonstrate some ideas of where a hydrogeologist's role comes into these different stewardships. And these are just a handful, there's so many. Um, but I'm going to give it a go anyway. Um, so how I might work with others in order to do to, to meet sort of these ideas of the stewardship. So we think back to the definition of earth stewardship and think of the relationships between hydrogeology, geothermal resources and human well-being. We come quickly to the sustainable development goals and how improved energy access can contribute to all of these different SDGs and inadvertently improve lives. So as a hydrogeologist, we are looking at a bigger picture here of um, what well understood geothermal and hydro um, thermal systems can do for our planet in a positive manner. And here we might want to work with people who represent all of the different SDGs 
but at a level appropriate to our resource development. So SDG2 and hunger, we might want to also work with food producers on geothermal greenhouses for greater crop productivity, like the example I mentioned to you earlier on. We also have to think about ecosystem resilience uh, and their relationships with hydrogeology and geothermal resources. So the biggest here is going to be the uh, groundwater dependent ecosystems. Uh, and these are the aquifer ecosystems where we have microbial communities that inhabit the pore spaces, cave and karst ecosystems that support both marine and terrestrial ecosystems, base flow stream ecosystems. So these are waterways that are supported by groundwater discharge or a spring fed, and they can support all manners of freshwater and terrestrial flora and fauna. Wetlands and swamplands. They rely on groundwater during dry seasons. They exist at groundwater surface water boundary and facilitate water flow between the two environments. And then estuarine and marine ecosystems, including coastal lakes, mangrove swamps, salt marshes, and seagrass beds. Now, of course, doing geothermal development, not all of our sites that we work on are necessarily, excuse me, going to apply to all of these different ecosystem resiliences. Um, but we still need to be thinking about all of this. If we're developing a system that's relying on water that's already in the subsurface rather than injecting it, bringing the water from somewhere else and injecting it, then we need to understand how removal of the groundwater could impact these different ecosystems and their resilience to groundwater removal. So we're looking at the links between groundwater and these environments and the impact the resource development might have on them so we can protect them. And so here, this is where we might want to work with con conservationists and biologists, probably more biologists to some degree as well. Environmental stewardship and hydrogeology. So when developing geothermal resources, especially those that rely on water and or steam to already be present in, the, in vast quantities in the subsurface, so those that plan to apply flash technology to power production in particular, we need to understand where all the water is coming from. So we can understand how groundwater abstraction might affect the recharge point. So for examples, if we have a lake recharging um, a reservoir abstraction might impact the wildlife, uh, which might in turn, dep um, depending on the locality, could impact tourism and income. And recharge from shallow aquifers could be impacted by over abstraction, resulting in diminished aquifer productivity. So, if we think for a second, the lake example. Um, Menengai Caldera in the middle of Kenya, which is a, a place that I've done a lot of work on, some of the recharge to that reservoir comes from Lake Nakuru. Lake Nakuru forms part of a national park. It is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and it's a Ramsar site. And when too much water um, drains from that lake, whether it's down to the geothermal resource, whether it's climate and evaporation, things like that, some of their Ramsar site lizards, um, start their numbers start to diminish. The flamingos, which is why it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, um, the water becomes diluted. The um, uh, the phytoplankton they feed on doesn't grow as as well, and so they migrate and they go elsewhere. And there's so many flamingos on this lake that you can see them from space. Um, recently, they also had to remove some of their protected uh, rhinos. Uh, because the lake environment wasn't stable enough for them. And again, there's, they don't know 100% if it's environmental, if it's geothermal, if it's a combination of both. But that just gives you an example of the kind of things we need to be thinking about. So when we're working on stuff like this, we would probably want to be working with modelers to understand some of this. This could include modeling chemistry changes, which is a bit of what I work on, or modeling the greater system. We might want to apply using software such as Freak, ModFlow, or LeapFrog for the modeling. Resource stewardship uh, and hydrogeology. So um, for this, uh, we want to know aspects of how the reservoir is going to respond to water abstraction. How much water can be abstracted without impact in production? And these um, impacts could include anything from chemistry changes, which in turn could change equilibration, uh, that may uh, change boiling temperatures, uh, it might increase mineral precipitation and therefore scaling risk to infrastructure. 
uh, steam ingress to liquid dominated reservoirs and things like that as well. So here you would want to look to work with geologists to understand the controls on recharge and therefore the reservoir tolerance to abstraction. Infrastructure engineers to mitigate for scaling and engineers and safety personnel for responses to spring kickbacks, which is associated with um, steam build, quite often associated with steam buildup. Social stewardship and hydrogeology. Um, it's important that uh, we think about the impact uh, resource development might have on small communities, uh, heritage and culture. And a well-documented impact of geothermal resource development on culture is the guise of decline and extinction in New Zealand. The Maori uh, tribes use geyser basins in many ways, including as sacred ritual spaces um, for therapeutic and medical uses, and as a source for warmth for heating, cooking, drying, bathing, and so on. Uh, but since the start of geothermal resource development on the North Island in the 1940s, there has been the extinction of more than 100 geysers due to industrial scale well withdrawal at the Wareiki site. There has also been geyser decline in Rotorua City due to the use of geothermal well heating systems. This is um, Carl Leonard. Uh, he is, here he's examining, examining the extinct Pakura geyser in I can't say this very well, so Wakarewarewa, I think is how we say it. Um, and the damage to the geysers were declared a crisis by the New Zealand government and prompted severe action to preserve the remaining geysers. All geothermal wells within one and a half kilometer radius of the extinct geyser and the declining Pahutukai geyser were closed permanently. And over time, this saw the recovery of the declining geysers um, this is Pahutu today, but the extinct geysers to this day have never recovered. And with that has been the loss of Maori ritual sites. You also have to remember that geysers are a tourist attraction and the extinction of them could also impact tourism and income. So protection of geyser, geysers requires strong relationships um, from the outset for the future management of geothermal fields adjacent to geyser basins around the world. So here you want to work with social scientists, anthropologists and policy makers uh, to understand what the importance is of these uh, specific sites and then ensure that they are protected. So continuing on with social stewardship and hydrogeology, additional considerations that require work alongside policy makers can be found in Kenya, where I spent most of my time working. When the Geothermal Development Company of Kenya identified locations for resource potential following exploration, compensation was offered to the communities for the use of the land. And you might think this is a great idea, and under normal circumstances it would be. <coughs> Excuse me. However, the problem in rural Kenya is that there is no land ownership arrangement. And while the rural communities from different tribes normally live peacefully, Offer of a monetary compensation resulted in conflict and the death of several people as the different tribes were all staking claim to the land and therefore the compensation. We also have examples from Olkaria geothermal in Kenya. Um, it's been developed crossing the boundary of Hell's Gate National Park and the area is homelands to the Maasai, many of whom live a nomadic pastoral life of cattle herding. And the park brought tourism and income to the women. Tribes people were relocated 15 kilometers away and land was surrounded by fencing. The area they were moved to was meant to have basic water and sanitation facilities, schooling and transport links and so on. But actually they found the water was not potable. Children who were in school had to travel to their original schools. So they're traveling at least 15 kilometers to get to school. Uh, and the women lost access to forest trade. The transport links that, that were there were very poor and where they did exist, they were too expensive. The pasture was not suitable for cattle and the fence blocked nomadic herding routes and access to historical Maasai grave sites as well. We also need to think as hydrogeologists about water related hazards or induced hazards more to the, more to the point. Um, and we need to be able to adapt uh, as sites are all going to be under risk from different types of hazards. So three hydrogeology activities that have hazards attached to them are abstraction, 
Over abstraction can lead to the risk of subsidence. Um, working with hydrogeologists, geologists, and engineers is really important here. Uh, Reinjection. Um, this is a big one, I think, uh, induced seismicity. Uh, in Europe, normal uh, induced seismicity at geothermal sites has been set to a magnitude of 0 0.5. If the mag magnitude rises to 1, further monitoring protocols are actioned. And if the seismicity rises to 1.5, the activity is suspended at the site until the cause can be identified and resolved. Um, a magnitude 1.5 is nothing. I know you guys are in a much more tectonically active region than I am, but even I know that a 1.5, you can barely feel if you're sat down. It's almost like a, a lorry rumbling past your front door. And then drilling. Um, so the activity of drilling, there is a risk of hydrothermal explosions. So if the hydrostatic pressure exceeds the drill string pressure, you quite often experience kickbacks. And if the system is um, steam dominated or has steam ingress into the system, you may sometimes get um, a steam blowout. And this is a steam blowout that I witnessed in Kenya a couple of years ago. Um, a violent induced hydrothermal explosion has uh, resulted in the formation of craters. Oops, sorry. Um, can, it can result in the formation of uh, craters. But this hasn't yet been uh, documented to have occurred uh, under geothermal resource development, but the risk is still there, it could still happen. Um, and this is because they are caused by the rapid phase change, which is what we're actually targeting at super hot fields uh, to generate electricity. So the risk is there. And to address these risks and mitigate for them, again, we want to be working across disciplines with hydrogeologists, geologists, engineers, drillers, and policy makers. There we go. So we also need to work with the public, local councils and educators. Um, a great example of good community engagement is the United Downs Deep Geothermal Project here in the UK. Um, so the deepest well, so the production well for this site is just over five kilometres and the injection well is two and a half kilometres. And you can see the image on the right there and um, that they've in intersected a fault that has high permeability. And so it's going to be run as a closed loop system. Um, but what these guys did is they were completely transparent with every aspect of the development. So the local communities and councils and schools were involved. They set up seismic stations in eight schools. So some of you might have heard of the Raspberry Shakes um, and educated them on what seismic activity was and what induced seismic activity might look like and things like that. And although we're not in a tectonically active region, the southwest, um, which is sort of, um, I don't know whether you guys can see my cursor, but this sort of very bottom left area here, and this is the heat flow map for the UK. Um, the southwest does have faults and they do move sometimes. And so when the children go into school every day, they can look at the data and they can see that there's been an earthquake, use technology and software to triangulate where that earthquake has come from. And then they realize that it's an earthquake that's on a fault and it's nothing to do with the development of the site and they don't have to worry about it. Whereas obviously we have a lot of issues with um, hydro fracking and induced seismicity. And so public perception isn't very good. But transparency that's been demonstrated at United Downs shows that actually if we are transparent right from the start and we educate people, that they're, all let, they're gonna be less resistant against development. So to address all of these things I've mentioned here today is a huge task, but it's vital in geothermal resource development. But how can we understand the impact and risks of geothermal resource development on an environment if we do not know the natural state of that, that environment? So we need to understand the environment we plan to develop before we develop it. I cannot stress this enough. And we do this with baselines. Um, for example, groundwater contamination, I've already mentioned, from heavy metals has been observed in some, some locations around the world. This contamination usually occurs naturally anyway, but we need to know the natural state of the water chemistry before we can then monitor and assess for any changes during and after development, and more to the point whether those changes are actually down to the development itself. The sampling for a range of chemistry are not just your bog standard sampling, so not just that sampling for your, your standard ions to understand um, 
your basic water chemistry and your water fascias and things like that. But un sampling for the more unusual stuff like your heavy metals and unusual isotopes that are dissolved within the water and things like that, like sulfates. It's really, really important to understand what the state of the system is before, during, and after the development. And you want to be sampling from a whole range of water sites as well. So from surface water, rivers and lakes, to drinking water boreholes, springs, geysers, anything you have access to to sample and sample correctly, you really need to be trying to do that. And some countries are really, really good at doing this, and some countries still have a long way to go, but we need to work to change the culture of prepared to take the risk of the, because of the demand for power. So this is a comment that I heard just on Monday this week at a webinar um, where somebody was asked about the monitoring and assessment of volcanic geothermal sites in Kenya. And they have no idea how active their volcanoes are, yet they are drilling into them to de develop geothermal resources. Um, and whilst we do that all over the world, in New Zealand and Iceland and things like that, these sites are normally monitored and they know how active these volcanic systems are. We saw just a couple of years ago the damage that the Hawaii eruption did to the Puna geothermal site. And that's the first time ever a volcanic eruption has impacted a geothermal site and they lost a considerable amount of infrastructure. However, because they knew the activity levels of Hawaii, and fair enough, Hawaii is very active, Ormat Technologies, who own Puna, have um, volcanoes insurance that even though the site was shut down they were still able to pay their employees for 18 months after the site was closed until it was brought back online they could of course claim insurance for the damage to the infrastructure and their drilling rig um, and they also had mitigations in place so that whilst the site wasn't producing power they could bring it in from somewhere else and so we need to be bringing these things online as well so I'm just going to leave you with this thought. So we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. We need to make sure we leave the planet in a better state than it's in at the moment. And geothermal is going to play a massive role in that without a doubt. But we need to make sure we are developing it in a way that is not making the environment worse. So just to finish off, um, I don't know if how many of you guys are familiar with uh, Women in Geothermal? I know Francesco is. So Women in Geothermal is uh, a global organization uh, promoting the education, professional development and advancement of women in geothermal. Um, and currently we have just over 1800 members around the world. Um, we have members from 74 different countries and 34 active chapters. Our targets for 2023 is this, so two and a half thousand members uh, one wing chapter in every geothermal country and a 50% male membership. So when Women in Geothermal was set up in 2013, 87% of those working in the geothermal sector were male. So to improve that balance of a 50-50 split, we need our gentlemen on board to ensure we get that balance and so that women are just as well represented within the sector as men are as well. You can go to this web link here. Um, we can share it after if I'm too fast and you don't get to write it down. If you want to find out more about Women in Geothermal, you can join up for free as well. You can find us on social media, including our new YouTube page. Um, and also uh, Peru has just very recently had their country chapter set up. So I'm on the UK committee chapter and I was the country ambassador 2015 to 2019. Um, and Peru has very recently set up their chapter as well. So if you guys are interested in getting involved with the Peru chapter, organizing webinar events for students, any ideas um, that, you, that you have to improve the visibility of geothermal, getting your community involved uh, and things like that, you can email um, Bridget Ailing. her email address is there. Um, she's on the US team, and the US team are currently the global team, so they are overseeing the entire global running of Women in Geothermal for the next three years. And then finally, um, just to bring to your attention the Energy Group. Um, so the Energy Group is a specialist group of the Geological Society of London. Anyone from around the world can join uh, the Geological Society of London, and with that you can, enjoy, you can join any of their specialist groups. Um, I'm also on the committee for the energy group as well. 
Um, it was formerly the Petroleum Group, but they have recently completely um, relaunched themselves to keep in line with the energy transition. So you can find out more about Energy Group here at this link. Again, I can email all, all of these over to Francesco if, you're, if I'm too quick for you. Um, and more about the Geological Society here as well. And that's me. That's everything. I hope that was satisfactory to you all <laughs> and i will stop presenting there we go maestro de ceremonias um, in the meantime, I would like to thank you for a brilliant presentation. I really enjoyed, and I think it has been very, very clear the message. We need to work in a multidisciplinary environment to avoid being considered a solitary and lonely wolf. Very good message, uh, Dr. Helen. Thank you for the guidance you are giving to the young people. We have. Uh, 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 several uh, young geoscientists, engineers, and uh, they will surely follow up your advice. Is the if anybody who's sorry, I was just going to say, if anybody here does have any questions, but maybe you're a little bit shy to come forward and ask in front of your mm -hmm. peers, um, by all means, send me an email and I'll get back to you. It's not a problem. Uh, Joan, did okay. you receive some questions? Recibiste uh, algunas preguntas? For now, um, yeah, eh, sí, buenas tardes. Eh, Podrían eh, los que desean hacer las preguntas o tal vez activar su micrófono para que la doctora la pueda responder. Eh, Podríamos esperar unos minutos, señor, para que elabore su pregunta, porque por el momento no hay preguntas. Todavía. Bien. <coughs> Uh, that is one of the areas we are also trying to improve is our English skills. Because, <laughs> uh, that is most of the reason that um, we have in South America, south of the Rio Grande. I would like to ask something. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Franklin. I am petroleum engineering and I am studied a PhD in uh, Mishkol University in uh, Hungary and I am very interested in this uh, in this meeting because uh, I really would like that uh, uh, understand uh, uh, what could you recommend for a petroleum engineer learned uh, to go into the geothermal energy because I am working I am working in the in a program of uh, geothermal now. Uh, really, I I am working in fracturing. Uh, I, I was very interested when you talk about the, the risk that we have uh, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, the, the problems when you fract fracturing and you can get some earthquakes in the, in the, in the places when you apply that. So in that mm -hmm. way, the, I would like that you recommend me something about the uh, uh, about the the risks. Uh, what uh, could I study about? Or, or uh, that's um, the the main the main question, I think. So I mean, working sort of working in the petroleum industry, like you say, you've uh, you're transferring over to geothermal, and there's many transferable um, skills. Most of induced seismicity risks in the petroleum industry are, I suppose they're less of a concern within the petroleum sector because most, not all of course, but most wells are either offshore or a good distance away from residential areas. Um, but this isn't the case with geothermal. Most geothermal is on land um, and depending on where you are, it's a lot closer to, to residential areas and, and people who might feel your induced seismicity under injection. Um, there's a lot of work out there. It's whether you can get access 
to it because some of it is sensitive data under the um, uh, under the people who own sort of the licenses. Um, but there is a oh, I'm trying to think what it's called now. <laughs> oh, um, the, so there's a new database that's just been put together by uh, Professor John Gloyas at the Durham Energy Institute in the UK yeah. and partners on induced seismicity all over the world from a whole host of um, developments. So whether that's geothermal drilling, uh, whether that's mine roof collapses, things like that. Um, off the top of my head, Franklin, I can't remember what it's called, but I have it somewhere on my computer. And what I will do is when I dig it out, I will email it over to Francesco. And Francesco, are you able to forward that on for me? Yes. Yeah? I will do that. Is that all right for you, Franklin? OK, that's good. OK. okay. Yes. Um, um, Victor Manuel. Francisco. Alguna preguntita para la doctora Ellen? Uh, it's not like a question, but I, I have a comment regarding your slide with the geothermal village network. When you were talking about the, so, the social scientist uh, in the mm -hmm. activities, I would like to add that also we need to understand very well the social context in the area, in the country. Because, yep, for example, in, in, in case of Peru, uh, we have a lot of issues with the mining and oil and gas industry. So when we go to the field and we start to explore for geothermal, the people think that we are liars and we are mining people that who wants to take the resources, the water, contaminate everything. So they don't want to listen about geothermal first. They want to understand who we are. And when, we, when they start to trust in us, then we, we can start to explain about geothermal. So this kind of context is particular for each region, even in Peru or in other countries, that we need to understand very well to have a good strategy and start with a good step in the project. Yes, Victor, you're absolutely, you're, you're absolutely um, right there. I mean, I've um, experienced that when I've been working in Kenya and I've, um, I've worked way up in the north in the Turkana Desert. It's very, very rural, very poor, um, but it's the area in Kenya that has the on-land oil and gas um, wells being drilled at the moment. And I wasn't up there for oil and gas. In fact, I wasn't even up there for geothermal. I was looking at um, uh, groundwater condition, conditions for desalination. Um, and I had to have uh, local people with me because they don't speak English and they don't speak Swahili and I can speak a little bit of Swahili. Um, they speak their local tribe language, the Takanan tribe uh, language. And so I had locals with me and every well I went to, we had to ask permission uh, to be able to sample their water, to look at the water quality. And most of them were fine with me sampling, but I did have a few people uh, a few tribe leaders who said they weren't happy with me sampling from the wells and like you say um, when I sort of explored mm -hmm. the reasoning behind this it's because they didn't know me they didn't trust me and they thought I was working for the oil and gas industry um, so you are absolutely right you have to build relationships with your communities and you have to realize that it's not going to happen overnight you have to invest an awful lot of time energy and effort to build trust with these communities that already don't trust geologists and engineers because other industries have given us a bad name, unfortunately. Um, but yes, you're absolutely right. And you're absolutely right in that it has to be adapted to not just to different countries, but areas within the countries as well. Yeah. Dr. Ellen, in Peru, we have the Shanay Timpishka. Oh Shanay Timpishka. And it is the boiling river in the jungle. I've heard of this. And uh, my friend uh, Andreas Russo, he usually do the reporting for National Geographic. He is the one who popularized. What happened there is that uh, we need to respect a lot the, the chief there because uh, they believe in the river. They think that it is a, a, a snake 
and it is communicating from down to up and so on. So before we go there, he need to ask permission and he needs to do some uh, rituals and so on in respect of uh, the team there. And um, it's fascinating because uh, it is 6.8 kilometers long. It starts with 80 uh, degrees and ends uh -huh. at 60, a very nice decay. It charges up and down. When you come to my country, we will uh, arrange a, a trip there. And, I would um, absolutely love to. I've heard of this place and I've heard of your colleague. I think I saw him do a presentation last year. Yes. Yes. And it was it's one place that's on my on my uh, list to try and to try and visit. Yes. But we cannot. I mean, this is where I, you know, I discussed um, in my presentation about cultural and heritage significances of, of sites around the world. And this is this is one of those very examples. And, you know, we're sort of a, a very modernized sort of community, if you like. Um, but we absolutely must not dismiss culture and heritage and the importance of these sites to the local communities we cannot do it because it's so disrespectful and if we have them on side they actually might help us um which is what we want because we need to improve our environment and our planet and the condition it's in and geothermal is going to play a role in that but we need communities on the side yes it's andres russo he's a, a volcano aficionado like you <laughs> He loves the volcanoes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> uh, Master of Ceremony, have you compiled some questions or do we still uh, broadcast with email to Dr. Ellen? Johan, lo podemos enviar por correo las preguntas a Dr. Ellen porque están formulándose en español, ¿no? Eh, sí, eh, sí, posiblemente. Eh, los que tengan las preguntas se puedan generar más adelante. Por el momento no hay preguntas. Eh, lo podemos okay. enviar al correo de, de la doctora. Pueden dejar las preguntas. There is going to be a few questions addressed to you by the hot team uh, members because uh -huh. they have some uh, um, exercises to solve and they, they, they will need your advice. Okay, yeah. no, that's fine. I'm I'm happy to to try and sort of chip in and and give some tips and things like that. If people if people want to either send me individual emails or maybe um, you can collate one email, one document, and I can address them all. Maybe. Yeah. Yes, we will uh, we will uh, compile them to make easy the communication. Yeah, sure. Johan. Tal vez uh, es momento okay. de agradecer. Ok. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Helen. Uh, my name is... Sorry, sorry. I'm... My screen. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Helen. Uh, my name is Joan Ochoa. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to thank you for your excellent presentation. And... Uh, on behalf of the Hotin team, uh, Hotin team Geotherma, we would like to we would like to have to have it uh, later for the next uh, presentation. Uh, in my just just <laughs> just like just like that, uh, I would like to thank you for your time, your work, uh, for sharing with with us. Thank you very much. Gracias. Thank you for the invitation. Gracias. <laughs> Angie. Angie, come in.
Carlos from Tacna. Uh, yes, Carlos. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Argele, at very present. My name is Carlos Daniel Pacachipana, student of the University Nacional Jorge Basare Groma. And on behalf of the university, we want to thank you for the excellent presentation. I know that will be very helpful for everyone. We hope to have your support in the next opportunity. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Eh, sí, ingeniero, el, el compañero Alexander no ha podido ingresar, así que le doy la, la palabra a usted para que pueda okay. eh, On behalf of uh, Alexander, he's from the Titicaca Lake. He has had some uh, stormy weather today. <laughs> But uh, we, what can I say, Ellen? Thank you very much for the brilliant presentation. And to the participants, I would like to tell them that this is the seventh lecture we have in our continuing education program in geothermal engineering, Pipeline to Future Talent, and it will continue this month with Reservoir. In March, we will have uh, drilling completions and surface equipment, and in uh, April, we will have monitoring. The field work, we are planning it for Q3. We have 25 places. We have uh, 16, uh, 18 participants. 12 uh, full-time and six uh, partial-time. There are still some uh, spaces for the ones interested. Just contact uh, our uh, team. And uh, with this, uh, I would like to reiterate our uh, thanks to you, Dr. Ellen, for your cooperation and uh, your patience as well. And uh, we will improve more and more with your help. Thank you very much on behalf of the Peruvian Geothermal Association. And by the way, I was the first one to join the Wing Peru. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> Actually, funnily enough, I figured you probably would have done because I was speaking to um, Kelly Blake um, yeah. about, about you the other day because I'd, I'd mentioned that I was talking for you guys and I, and I was saying, you know, is there a Peru team in place so that I knew what to include about Wing? In yeah. the presentation, she said, "Oh, is that with Francesco?" I was like, "Yeah." <laughs> <laughs> But uh, thank you very much for your support, and uh, thanks to all the participants. And we should continue taking care of our families, and don't let us be dominated by this Oriental virus. Thank you very much today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much y gracias a todos por asistir. Y, eh, si tienen alguna pregunta lo pueden hacer en el, en el chat y lo, eh, lo, se lo compartimos a la doctora. Y posiblemente se lo enviamos las respuestas a cada correo de cada participante. Muchas gracias por su presencia y nos estaremos viendo en otra oportunidad. Thank you very much. Gracias. Hasta luego. Thank you very Hasta much, Helen. Chao. Chao, chao. Chao, Daniel. Ah. <laughs> <laughs>